doctor in uh, England and uh, he was famous in uh, there in that region for always catching large fish and winning trophies with the large fish he was catching and one day he was one of his one on one of his frequent fishing trips to a particular valley where there was a river he liked to fish and he got a call from a woman at a farm near there that she was giving birth. So he hurried over there to deliver a healthy baby boy. The farmer didn't have anything to weigh the baby with, so the doctor had to use his fishing scale. The baby weighed 22 pounds and 10 ounces. <laughs> This sermon is about pleasing God today. So first you have to decide whether you want to please God. You know, some have the mindset of enlisting, enlisting God to please themselves. We get saved, we start going to church, and we expect God to bless us, to heal us, and, and to take us into heaven one day. And those are all things he wants to do for us because he loves us. But God owns us. It's not the other way around. We believers have given ourselves to God. Romans 6, 20 to 22. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. Verse 22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. Would you bow your heads with me right at that point? Dear Lord, we do thank you for the awesome truth of the gospel. That there's good news, Lord, if people will just embrace it. That there's salvation and freedom if people would just capitulate and bend their will to yours and say, yes, Lord, I believe in you. I receive you as my Savior. If they would just do that, Lord. The gospel, which means good news, is theirs. So we just, uh, we just honor you today by looking into ways that we can please you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So the new life that we have is about being a servant of God. It's not about him being a servant to us. He's the master. We are the servants. It's good for us to remind ourselves what our relationship with him is. We were, we were bought with a price. And a dear price it was, as you know. It was the blood and suffering of our dear Savior. That was the price. No other price could buy anything from God except for that. So we need to be profitable servants now that we are his servants. He has entrusted us with words that lead to eternal life. We have been trusted with that. We have been touched by God. We have been changed. We have been set free from the law of sin and death. The old sinful nature is gone. The Holy Spirit takes up residence within us. We have been made holy. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. He will do it, the scripture says. He will sanctify you. He makes you holy. It's the righteousness of Christ that's imputed. That word means put onto us. Our own righteousness doesn't get us anywhere with God. 
You can't say, Lord, I've been, I've been this and I've been this and I've been this. Now you have to bless me. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't have to do anything. <laughs> Our righteousness is flawed because it's self-righteousness and, it, and we're supposed to be that way. But we can't bargain with God with it. Amen? Amen. So he made a way. It's the only way. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. So out of a grateful heart comes our desire to please God. If you don't look at your life and you're a born-again believer and you don't have a grateful heart for what God has done and what He's doing for you, something's wrong. You need to go back to the cross. Amen. You can't have a ho-hum attitude about salvation. Amen. It can't just be one in a line of things about your life. It's the very first thing, the very top thing, the very most important thing about your life. Amen. We've been redeemed. We don't have to face the eternal consequences of sin. So out of our eternal gratitude comes a desire to please the one who saved us. The question is then, how to please him? How do we, who are not God, who have never seen God, know how to please God? He already owns everything. He doesn't need anything. What can we, we mortals do to please him? The happiest we can be is when we're in God's will. No matter what kind of snarling hounds are nipping at our heels, no matter what kind of stuff is happening around us, the happiest we can be is when we're in the will of God. Pleasing God brings us into a place of peace. We kind of know when we're out of the will of God because there's no peace. We know. We have, a, we have a guilt about it when we wander away. Ultimately, we will be the most fulfilled when we fulfill God's purpose for our lives because he loves and wants the best for us forever. So we'll have a look at a few ways the Bible tells us that we can please God. Number one, having faith pleases God. It says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a re that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, 6. So we can't please God without faith. Faith means you wrap your heart around God and who he is and your relationship with him. Belief in God and believing he will do what he says he will do is a prerequisite for pleasing God. It also gives a prime example of this kind of faith in Hebrews 11:5, where it says, By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleases God. We're talking about pleasing God today. Enoch lived in the increasingly evil world before Noah, before the flood. But he didn't go the evil way other people were going. Instead, he walked with God and he pleased God. When we believe in God and believe what he says, that faith will also please God. Number two, being holy pleases God. Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. 
Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We don't spend much time thinking about being holy, but God expects us to be holy. Be holy even as I am holy, God says. So being holy pleases God. Number three, being spiritually minded pleases God. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be so then. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It's in Romans chapter 8, 6 to 8. There are two mindsets. The normal human one, the fleshy carnal mind, in which we seek to please ourselves, and the one led by the Spirit of God, that is the spiritual mind. Thus having the Holy Spirit dwelling in us and leading us is another prerequisite for pleasing God. The fourth one, the fear of the Lord pleases God. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. Psalm 147, verse 11. It's not that God delights in having us be terrified of him. But this psalm describes God as one who heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That's in verse 3. The passage praises his mercy, his knowledge. He knows the names of all the stars and his power to save the humble in verse 4. To six, the Bible tells us to fear God, not because it's good for him, not because he likes it, because it's good for us. Amen. <laughs> it's good for us to accurately recognize that he is more powerful than anything. Acknowledging that shows our deep respect for him where it says fear that's respect the proper fear and respect of God will motivate us to avoid sin Exodus 20 20 it reminds us that God will hold us accountable for our actions one day all those who are outside of the will of God outside of salvation will be trembling. One day they will tremble. At the conclusion of all things, they will be stricken with panic. But not us. Fearing God encourages us to rely on Him and to revere Him, which can deepen our love for the all-powerful God, who cares enough to stoop down and deliver a puny little human like any of us. <laughs> Number five, studying and following Jesus Christ's example pleases God. Matthew 17, 5, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love with him. I am well pleased. Listen to him. We, can, we, we quote that verse, but we don't think about that last part. Listen to him. God wants us to listen to Jesus. During an event that we know as the transfiguration God impressed on Peter, James, and John, the preeminence of Jesus Christ, Jesus truly was the Son of God, and there is no one who has pleased God more than Jesus. We should all hear him and follow his example. Number six, obeying God pleases him. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? 
Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. 1 Samuel 15, 22. God's looking for obedient servants. Obedient. The prophet Samuel in that passage was expressing God's displeasure with Israel's, Israel's first king. Know who that was? Saul, King Saul. <laughs> Saul had disobeyed God's direct command with the excuse that the people had wanted to give what should have been destroyed to God. But God doesn't want our physical gifts. If we're going to break his laws to give them, that's what was happening. He told them not to do that, and they did it. They thought they were pleasing God by doing something he said not to do. Crazy. So God took the kingdom away from him, the kingship away from him, and gave it to David. God doesn't command us to obey just because it's good for him, but because it's good for us. Deuteronomy chapter 10, 12 and 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. His laws and commands are beneficial to us. And as a result of obeying him, we grow in godly, righteous character. We become more like him, which is what we seek to do. And that is another way that we can please God. Number seven, doing God's will pleases him. And may God make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hebrews 13 and 21. So what is God's will? God desires, God's desire, his commands and his plans are expressed throughout the Bible. In fact, the Bible was given to show us his will and to help us, in a sense, read his mind. The things he wants us to know came from his mind and an inspiration to the writers, and it's in those pages. Studying the Bible, meditating on it, and praying about it are, are keys to gaining deeper understanding of His will. God's will for us goes beyond just knowing what He wants. It involves doing every good work, working at maturing spiritually and becoming more like God. Matthew 5 and 48. Jesus Christ set the ultimate example of doing God's will when he faced the terrible scourging and crucifixion for our sins yet he prayed nevertheless not my will but yours be done Luke 22 42 he was willing to give himself totally to show his love and to do his father's will if we want to learn how to please God we must seek God's help to always do His will as well. Seeking God's help. Number eight, giving the sacrifices He wants pleases God. Therefore, by Him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. That's in Hebrews 13, 15 and 16. 
God rejected the sacrifices that were gained through disobedience, but these are sacrifices that he is well pleased with, including giving praise and thanks to him and sharing with others. These reflect his teaching and love expressed in two great commandments that summarize the rest of the law. You shall love the Lord your God with, uh, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And that's in Matthew 22, 37 to 40. So we have to be pleasing God and not man. Our temptation is to please ourself, our loved ones, our children. That's, that's, that's where, where our mind takes us sometimes. It's natural human tendency to seek to please other people. Those that we can see. We can find it harder to focus on pleasing God, the one that we cannot see. Jesus pointed out the problem with seeking to please man while, he, while uh, pretending to please God in the Sermon on the Mount, which is contained uh, most of it in Matthew chapter 5. He said, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. That's in Matthew 6, 1. He made similar comments about praying and fasting to gain favor from men in verse 5 and verse 16. Instead, we should do these things privately, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. That's in verse 4. The Apostle Paul uses an interesting term to describe doing things just to be seen by others. He calls it eye service. Bond servants obey in all things your masters uh, according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as in sincerity of heart, fearing God. That's in Colossians chapter 3. Paul himself understood the importance of pleasing God, not man. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts, Thessalonians 2 and 4. When we think about it, we realize that God is the ultimate source of all the good things that we have received and that we continue to receive. Even those things that come through family, friends, and other people, God is still the source. If you get healed because the doctor puts some medicine in you, that's a good thing, and it comes from God through the doctor. Yes. Amen. If you go to the chiropractor and he makes you feel better, God is working through his hands. I told that to my chiropractor. My chiropractor fell in, the, fell in the driveway. He lives about a block and a half away from us. And he found him in the driveway, unconscious. And he had a 90-some percent blockage in both carotid arteries. Opened his scalp. They had to put stitches in his scalp and clean out those arteries and put him back together again. And I called him up. I have his cell phone. He takes me fishing and I make his flies for him, my friend. I called him up and I told him, I said, you are a healer. I said, all good things come from God. And you use your hands to heal people. I said, so the power of God flows through your hands to bring that blessing. And I said, you can probably feel that, but you don't say anything about it because people will think you're crazy. He said, you're right. I said, well, I want to pray for your recovery because I'm a man of prayer. You're a man of touch. I'm a man of prayer. And I prayed for his recovery with him on the phone. 
But all these good things come from God, whether they come from CAT scans or inoculations or no matter what they come from. It comes from God if it's a good thing and it helps you. He has given us all our blessings. I heard Bob say his back doesn't hurt so much. It's a blessing. It comes from God. They put a shot. It feels better. But God made that blessing. And he offers us eternal life as his children. First John 3, 1. He deserves all of our honor and worship. He deserves our praise. As King David said, <clears throat> every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable or beyond our understanding in Psalm 145, 2 to 3. The angels in God's presence clearly see this. Revelation describes the 24 elders casting their crowns before God's throne and saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. He is worthy of our praise and our honor. He is worthy to have us be profitable servants. And the way we do that is to share the gospel. He entrusted it to us. He gave it to us. Not to keep it all wrapped up in our own self. Not to keep the light under a bushel. But to share it. And spread it. And spread it. And spread it. And even though, even though they shout you down and say, no thanks. I've only ever had one person say, ran away from me, say, no thanks. But when I'm sharing the gospel, I'm careful to perceive from the Spirit of God whether that person is going to receive that. You can tell. I can tell. I know when they're going to receive that. I know they are. I've only had one that bolted and ran away. And he called me up because his mother was dying and wanted me to lead her to the Lord on her deathbed. Which I did. She was, uh, she couldn't respond vocally. She could only be here, here in one ear. He said, you have to talk right into her right ear. I got a hold of her hand. And I said, I want you to squeeze my hand if you understand what I'm saying. She squeezed my hand. I shared the gospel with her. Do you understand? She squeezed my hand. I said, I'm going to pray this prayer a few syllables at a time. I want you to pray it with me in your spirit. I know you can't pray out loud. Each time, squeeze my hand. About three days later, I preached a great graveside service for her. We don't recommend waiting that long. But something happened in his life that caused him to want that for his mother, and he was the one that ran away from it. So I th I'm sure that he got saved in the meantime. It just wasn't me that carried, that got to leave him, lead him to the Lord. But if you're going to be a profitable servant, then you can't just keep it all to yourself. You have to share it. Amen. That's one of the ways, one of the most important ways that we can bless God, that we can praise Him, that we can please Him. It's by sharing the gospel and bringing other people into the kingdom. They don't come in a church. Sinners don't come to church anymore. Once in a while, they do. Once in a while. I said to Kate when she was here, <clears throat> because I was with her when she preached the salvation message with an altar call, and I said to her, I said, you can just about assume that everybody in this place is a born-again believer. 
they have other needs. So it's one on one, you know. When I when I lead somebody to the Lord, it's almost always one on one. One on one. It didn't used to be that way. I used to give a call in church, people would come. But churches are full of believers now. <laughs> they are. But we all have a testimony. We all have something to say. Was that a car? Yes. Somebody finally got here. I heard a truck go off. <laughs> Would you stand? I'm going to dismiss the service. Dear Lord, we have been honored to share your word, to bring these morsels to the family in this house, Lord. And uh, I think of the people that aren't here. I ask you to bless Clyde. He's not here because of his uh, of his health, Lord. But the rest that can't be here because of the traffic, I just ask you to bring them safely through that, Lord. And I ask you to minister to anybody that was in an accident and is injured because of it, Lord. And be with your people, Lord. Just be with us until we gather again. Bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's Scotty and Ruth.